Hello, my name is Maurice Washington. I want to welcome everybody to another episode of Executive Talk. Those who are watching at home, those who are watching on Facebook Live, or those who are watching on YouTube. Remember, all, all those platforms, except for the TV, of course, you can communicate with us. Make sure we join this conversation and make sure that you're sharing this, this information. This is information that's just not for you, but this is for everybody. We never know what's going on and, you know, as an office, as a business owner, and also as an employee, you have a lot of things that go through your mind day to day and a lot of things that you're pushing through. And these can maybe help you get through some of those moments and push you through just in a more progressively way. So, um, and I also remind everybody, please open up your hearts. You know, with these particular shows, it may hit you directly. And when something hits you directly, the tendency is to shut it off and not accept maybe what's hitting you. This is what the Lord, Lord has given me to actually communicate, and I want to make sure that you guys understand it's that arena that we're coming from. And again, our goal and purpose is, again, it's about the heart and soul of your business. So let's go ahead and get into today's topic. This is the continuation from the character to, build, to change the character to build success. This is all about character. And what I'm, the things that I'm learning are very, very exciting, and I want to make sure I share that with you. And in this particular segment, we're talking about being on purpose and how effective that is. This is a four-part series. In that four-part series, please make sure that you go back in the archives on YouTube and also on Facebook to actually view the, uh, the first two shows. So that way, this, these shows start to make sense. But again, they all collide together. But being on purpose, why is that so important? It, being on purpose is one of those weird things. It is weird because I can self-righteously be on purpose and say, you know, what's the purpose and have an attitude about it. Well, that is a purpose. But again, there's a self-righteous way of being on purpose also. But how does that work for you spiritually? And let's go back. Let's go backwards from that perspective, uh, purpose on a, on a spiritual note. And how is it affecting your day to day? Because purpose is very important for all of us. It's something that we all need. It's something that provides conclusion for us. It provides a lot of strength for us. But without it, it makes life extremely hard. And so we're going to talk about how this is, and to continue on, we're going to talk about how this plays out into your office space and some of the things that you might be going through. So let's talk about this, life without purpose. Let's go ahead and start there. Life without purpose is, again, one of the most dangerous moments that you can be in. It does not feel good. But this is what the enemy expects us to be in, because if we're struggling with purpose, these are the top five things that it, that it hits us directly. It hits your decision-making skills. You will you'll have a hard time making decisions and ultimately start making a lot of, the, a lot of wrong decisions. It becomes a trail. It becomes a, a way of life. You don't know it. But that's just what's happening. So decision-making, life without purpose, gives you, it, it compromises your decision-making. So that way, again, you start creating the life in the pattern of death. Because what is the enemy interested in? Remember, you have an office space. Remember, you have access to clients. So he's actually interested in you hurting others, others around you. That's what the biggest interest is without, in walking without purpose. And so your leadership skills, as a, if, if, I'm, if you're listening and you're a business owner, he wants your leadership skills. If you're listening and you're an employee, he wants your leadership skills in that, in that particular position. Because again, if you're not operating in a leadership role and you're not being that leader in that role, well, you start affecting others because people will depend on that leadership. The accountability. If you're not on purpose, what are you accountable for? And does it matter if you're accountable for it? That's the thing about being on purpose. It, it starts to hit right in that accountability component. Again, it's, it's interesting that we can actually create what we feel is accountable, but are we really being accountable if we're struggling with purpose? What about direction? Well, how can I be that leader if I'm not being accountable and I'm struggling with direction and my decision making is there? Vision. Well, if you're, how can your purpose and how can, if you're struggling with purpose, how can your vision be, be, be direct? Because you need that vision for all this stuff to, how am I going to lead, where am I going to lead people to? All this stuff starts to ping pong 
off of each other. So if I'm struggling with my vision, how am I going to actually lead you with good decisions and take you in that right direction and then be accountable in, in leadership? All that stuff starts to funnel. And this is what life looks like, and this is where a lot of people are very uh, consumed with being hurt. Without purpose, you have pain. Now, this is one of those moments in life that you're not going to sit here and say, hey, guess what? I'm struggling with purpose. How about you? That conversation never happens, does it? Maybe in a roundabout way, but I'm not, I'm not, I may not even know it enough to actually tell you that I'm struggling with purpose. So this becomes my reality, but again, like in one of my examples, I opened up a business before in my life without purpose, without understanding what my purpose is. I made a lot of bad decisions, so this is actually talking about me quite a bit. So let's talk about leaders and how this thing starts to show up. Because there's a relationship that develops when you talk about business or employers, um, business owners, and employees. Leaders give off the perception that you have found your purpose. I want you to think about that for a minute. Leaders give off the perception that you have found your purpose. There's an allure to you. When people say, oh, you're a business owner, that wow factor is not, is, it's not because you're a risk taker. It's because part of it is people are looking at you saying, wow, you found, your, you found a purpose. That's amazing. Huh, how did you do that? So they're, they're virtually kind of impressed by you. There's envy that happens. There's a little judgment. There's all that stuff that starts to filter. But because, again, the perception is you have found a purpose that you're able to stop being W-2 and start to make a move day to day and keep going forward with the fact that you may not, because it takes a lot of faith in order to be a business owner. So this is a perception that you're carrying when you say even just the words. Not that people have been or have purchased from your business, but just the fact that you say I'm a business owner, you exude something. So let's think about the office building and money. What does that do to employees? Okay, so I created an office space. I have, I have the revenue to pay your insurance. I have the revenue to pay you a nice salary. I have these things in place so, so the, you know, things can start to happen for your life just as well as my life. And when I go in for the interview, as an employee, I'm coming to your office space and I'm looking at everything like, wow, look at all this. Huh. Because everything I see becomes a purpose. And let's not think of, so let's step away from the business owners. Let's think about this potential employee. Let's, let's remember not every employee is coming to you and they're eight, from 18 to, let's say, 45 with just one job that they've been part of. If they've never been a business owner, then typically they probably have about five to six jobs on their resume right now. As we discussed in, before, that person is not only looking for jobs and more money and stuff for my family and so on and so forth. I may be, as an employee, a potential employee, looking for my purpose. So a lot of those situations when it comes to your resume and you see all those that one to five years worked here, one to three years worked here, were here. Am I, is that employee not trying to find out where they're supposed to be? Remember, majority of lifetime, we're not growing up with the direction on here's your purpose and let's line you up in this lifetime. The parents and the children may just be, again, struggling all together, just in general, with what is a purpose. So as an employee, I come in, and, but what do I see? I look at your office space, I'm like, wow, this, this could be my purpose also. Oh, this might be the it. This, this might be that, that, that final destination for me. I can, I, I can dig this. So let's think about the employee-employer relationship. It's the, mer the merging of the purpose. This is what's the, the most important part about the employee-employer conversation is that you're sitting down at the round table, you're trying to ask them specific questions, again, based off HR principles and rules of, so what's your, you know, what are you looking for? Here's what we do in the employers, here's what we do as a company, here's what we offer, here's what we try to get to our client base, and you know, it sounds fantastic. 
you know, when you're listening as an employee to that employer, your ears are much different. Your employee is listening to like, wow, he has all the, he or she has all this, has all this money, and also is very focused on helping people get this because this is what they're struggling with. I can get on board with this. It's a merging of, when, so when the employer is, again, discussing about that position and what it means to the, to the client base, we're talking about how this whole purpose works. And so majority of the decision is you're making the decision on the employer, but you're also making the decision on the purpose that that employer is developing. That's where this relationship starts to bond. It's no different than uh, just a regular relationship. So if this doesn't forge to you from that perspective, let's think about it in your personal life. It's all about the merging, merging of purposes. That's the, the emerging bond there. So how does this work? How does this start to develop Ephesians 6, 5 through 9? Because again, that's a lot of the principle of this particular show is that it's, it comes from Ephesians 5, 6 through 9. It says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win favor when their eyes on you, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who was in both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism in him. Now, here's what I want to key in on. This particular component right here, this top sentence right here, merges everything else that's being said down there. And it is, obey, it's not the whole obey your earthly masters, but with respect and fear. Do you know if I start to understand your purpose, I start to fall in love with everything that you're saying? My heart is open. My respect and fear of messing up your purpose, and if I come onto your business, I have so, so much respect and fear that I do not want to mess up what you're developing. I want to be part of it. I just don't want to mess it up. So that respect and fear, that diligence is there. So this merges that relationship of that employer-employee in the very beginning because, again, we're thinking that we're merging onto a purpose. Then everything else starts to, starts to happen. So, and what do I mean by everything else starts to happen? Let's talk about it. You know how it is in relationship. The first three, six months, it's blissful. You, you, you brag to your friends that you got a new job. You post it on Facebook, social media. You put a conference call with your family. <laughs> I mean, it's a whole scenario because you're so excited about being at this new job. You have finally found something that's really hitting your heart. Now, your employer is like, whew, I have found the best employee. I, I, where has this person been? It's perfect timing. Lord, thank you, Jesus. Woohoo! All right, that's the first six months of that relationship. Okay? And if you can't resonate with that, resonate in that personal relationship. It's the same thing. Now, the first six months, you're, you're on time. The communication's on point. Um, things are getting done. I mean, this, this, the care, the respect and fear, and the serving the whole heart of this scripture is happening in the first six months. That's actually why it feels so good. Because scripturally, you're already starting to operate and how God sees it. Well, something has happened in the beginning or from the beginning. And what is that thing? If I start to see after the six months, because again, that relationship is heightened. So when you think about any relationship that was heightened at one point and starts to dwindle down, what is that contributing factor? Remember, I'm at my all time, I'm very submissive at this moment. Okay, that scripture that we just read through six, Ephesians 6 through 5, or Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, is all about love and submission. Because that's the only way that you can get along with another individual. That's what it takes. So he's talking about merging two various, two people, okay, with two different backgrounds into a company, into a purpose. In order to merge that correctly, it takes love and submission to, to happen. But as an employee, if I'm with you and I start looking around 
I start, if there's other employees in the office, and I look around, they're unhappy. If I look around and I'm unhappy, if I'm looking around and I remember our conversation, because again, when you're loving submission, you actually remember so much of the conversations that, you, that you've had before. And when those conversations not, start to not develop, you feel like you're sold. And as soon as you start to feel like you're sold, then you start to go against the grain. That's again, the attack on the enemy is to attack, scripturally, attack you scripturally so that way you stay out of bounds. Now, what, what part of the scripture that we, did we have you pay attention to? With respect and fear. That relationship, once I start to see things are not matching up the way that we had talked about in the very beginning, I start, lack, it attacks my submission. I start to lose the respect. Once you lose that respect, then everything else that comes along with love and submission starts to dwindle. That's how this relationship starts to go sour. That's why we see so many office spaces in turmoil. Once the employee starts to see you're now on purpose, you've lost that respect. That's what the, the merging factor of any relationship needs to be. So when you think about cleave onto one another and when you talk about marriage, that cleaving is that respect and that on purpose. And if you're not on purpose about stuff, you start to lose that respect. And when you start to lose the respect, it actually starts to divvy up that cleaving and what it takes to stay together. Because again, no matter what relationship that you're in, it takes it's two different people from two different backgrounds that come in in two different directions on everything. But in the weird way, we're trying to get to the same goal. So once I see if I'm an employee and I see that your Lord is money, I start to submit to money also as an employee. If I start to see that's the only thing you actually really care about, you told me that this is a mission, you told me that this was the purpose, but the only thing you actually keep on promoting is we need more sales. We need, we need, we need, we need more, we need more. Guess what I've heard from you? I've heard that you actually serve money. You have this, you have this vision. You have this blanket purpose. That's what I'm looking for. You have this blanket purpose that you told me and that I'm committed to. Because again, if I came on board, I didn't come on board with a, here's your annual salary right here today, did you? No, I came on board with nothing. Maybe willing to sacrifice a couple of weeks without no nothing to, to get on board. <clears throat> so that, there's a sacrifice in there. But once I see this is all about sales, 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 and we need to increase sales by this much, well, then I start to lose respect. But what I start to do is I start to, start to serve the same thing you serve because we're always going to be in align, alignment no matter what. Now, this action has changed the dynamics in the relationship. Your office is no longer the same as to when that first conversation happened. And the thing is, it doesn't start with just that one person, this one example, this new employee. It actually becomes a trend of how your office is because that's all you know as a business owner. So you start hiring and you do the same thing to every person that comes in. You can only teach what you know. And if your purpose is money, all you're teaching is money. That's what, how the office space starts to become, starts to be conformed. So we think about, in, in the business terms, we call it retention. What is re, the retention of your employees? How do they stay? And how do they love being here? And we have all these things for employees and HR and all these studies based off of that, which they're, they're, they're viable. But they're viable to a point because if you miss the reason why all these studies are coming from, which is, again, the on purpose, then what did you do all the extra studying from? You missed the root. The root issue is the on purpose and where it's coming from. So it's not, it's not so much about re it's retention, it's relationship retention. What did the enemy come to destroy in the very beginning? He didn't come to destroy the animals. He came to destroy the relationship and how we relate to each other. 
So your relationship retention is where everything sits. It's not about how do, am I going to hire more people? How can I hire and develop more relationships that are going to focus and key in on this relationship or on the purpose? But that's the issue in office space. We don't, we're not looking at is, well, I got a new, I hired five new employees and we have to keep moving and keep growing. No, no, no. How do you do with relationships? If majority of your office is struggling being there and you bring on somebody else, what do you think that's going to do? It's going to be, it's going to, it's, got, it's like a new car. You buy a new car, you're excited about it. It's the best thing. You forget about everything else in life. But guess what? You still have the same habits of not maintaining that car, and it goes to put just like anything else. Same thing with relationships. It's the same difference. So now you're operating on the same playing field, and this is where the employer-employee relationship has come. This is how you know the employee or I'm sorry, employer-employee relationship has changed. What I start to do as an employee, I come in the office because now I'm really frustrated. Because remember, I was willing to come on board and wait two weeks and maybe miss a couple of bills to make sure I came on board to your purpose. I was okay with that. I was willing to sacrifice because your purpose to me and what I'm looking for in my life was that amazing. But once I get in, I start to see that there's no purpose. Well, then what else again? Remember what we talked about earlier. What is the sole purpose of the office space all of a sudden? It's your money. So I start looking at the office like, hmm, they don't work over there. Oh, my boss, he definitely doesn't work. He gets paid a whole bunch. Um, yeah, Sue over there works in the same department. And she barely comes, but her salary is bigger than mine. Where's my money? Where's my money? That's what I start to look for. That's why every year at the re annual review, you want your raise, and that, that raise is so exciting to the individual because, of course, you get to spend more, you have a little bit extra in your, in your pocket. But ultimately, it's like the, uh, the adrenaline shot that you need. It's like a five-hour energy. I'm not promoting. That's what you should drink. But for you to stay on for another year, it keeps you there. It wasn't the purpose again, was it? It has become about the money. So the office is already operating off of a low level, off of a temporary level of operation. It's no longer about the mission. Because it's interesting, you can get good at doing a particular department and forget about why you're doing that department. So once I, as a business owner, what happens to me is once I realize that I've lost your respect, well then I have to develop, I still need to lead. Because that scripture still says, obey your earthly masters. So, dysfunction of lack of purpose is I start to become oppressive. If I can be oppressive to you, you'll stay. Because one thing about humans is we're used to being oppressed. We're used to being abused, and we think it's okay. Well, you know, I got, a, I got another raggedy job. I you know, went from five jobs to another raggedy job. It's my trail of life, whatever. That's what we do. That's where we have conformed ourselves to, that death is okay. So an oppressive leadership starts to, starts to take form. And what is that oppression? <clears throat> In the Bible it says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Well, if you're not operating biblically, then these weapons do prosper. And that weapon that becomes formed against you in the office space is fear. Fear is a very powerful thing. If you're, not, if you're not strong spiritually. The owner starts to lead with fear. Because I, if I lost your respect, because I don't know why you're acting the way that you're acting. I mean, I gave you a job. I'm paying you. I mean, geez, employees just suck all the time. I just say, oh, whatever. Jeez, this whole life just stinks. <clears throat> well, I, I'll create fear. I will create fear for you to make sure that you stay. I'll have you in a little bit of turmoil emotionally because that's the only thing I can lead with because, again, that scripture says respect and fear. But once respect is gone, what else do you have left? You have fear. That's how that works, and that's why fear is the first weapon formed against you in the office space. <clears throat> Owners, did you know when you lose a great employee, this is a, this is a contributing factor to their departure? 
I want you to think about that for a minute. This is a contributing factor to their departure. Whenever you start seeing relationships that you can say, man, that was an excellent one. I shouldn't have lost that. Why would that person leave? They've been here since the day one and so on and so forth. Why? Because it's interesting that the bad employees always stay around. The ones that get on your nerves, you actually can't wait for them to leave the office space. You, you know, you're like, please, please quit. <laughs> I, I really don't, please go. Yeah, and let's just be real, that's just how it is sometimes. You have that relationship. But it's the good ones that we seem to hurt the most, huh? Why does a good employee actually leave? The one who cares that has remembered the purpose and is sticking to it. But you may have forgot, but they didn't. It's because that relationship was only there because of the purpose. But we forgot money has taken its root and has taken place of that relationship. And now one person is on the, on the purpose and one person is thinking about the money. And everything, the dynamics has changed. So now the communication starts to hit now. It starts to trying to talk about the same things, but we're coming at it in a different way. If I want money, I'm going to communicate one way, but if I want purpose, I'm going to communicate in a different way. So now we're at odds with each other for no reason because we don't know where the missing component is. It's on purpose. It's about the purpose. This is where we're at, people. What do you guys think about that? Leave your comments. Leave your comments on Facebook, on, on YouTube. Let's keep this conversation going because these are some of the things that are just hitting me and it's just changed a lot of my dynamics as well. To actually understand with the impact of even when at, at a certain point when I was struggling with my purpose as to how it showed up in my client, client relationship. I was trying to jam things down and trying to move things forward that weren't supposed to be there. Why? Because I struggled with purpose. But once the purpose starts to, get, became, starts to hone in, I started, my environment changed. In that environment change, that's what we're going to talk about in the next show, is how that environment change takes place and actually an example of how it was, how it was supposed to be as a leader. I want you guys to join the conversation on Facebook. I want you guys to join the conversation on LinkedIn and also on YouTube, and let's keep this thing going. I want to thank you guys for joining in today, but actually in the meantime, I really, really have to get back to work. Thank you and have a great day. Bye-bye.